Thirty two ticks following. So they are swallowing. Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow two will fly and come and swallow. You're a swallow in a hollow gallo. Making a whole lot of halabalu. Charlie Kalu, we know say you took the money, song, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Welcome to the RK Arts and Book Festival 2020 online. My name is Kadria Ahmed and I'll be moderating a panel conversation on leadership and inclusion. My guests will be Dr. Wumpimi Fatima Mohammed, a Ghanaian feminist activist and scholar and an assistant professor of global media industries at the University of Georgia. Joining us will also be Mr. Boniface Mwangi, a Kenyan who is passionate about justice, equity, and works with like-minded individuals to build better societies. And Ms. Winsola Abiola, a Nigerian politician who is also uh, an advocate for gender equity and youth inclusion in government. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so um, this is a conversation really um, on leadership, uh, particularly with... Um, the way that young people on the continent engage with leadership. Can I start by asking if we have a consensus that leadership in Africa is problematic, to say the least? Dr. Fatima? Yes, um, we have a leadership problem in Africa currently, and it would seem that across the continent, um, when you look at the precedents that we have in many countries across the continent, they, are, they would be categorized in the aging population. So we don't have a lot of young people, um, especially at the highest levels of office on the continent. And even within the parliamentary space um, in many countries in Africa, um, these spaces are dominated by older people who have you know, been, I'll, I'll use Ghana as an example, we've had um, some people who've been in parliament for 20, 25 years, uh, 30 years, you know, serving terms over and over again and not bringing much change to their community. So we definitely have a leadership problem. And the problem is that youthful people or young people are often excluded from um, leadership positions in many countries on the continent. And um, Mr. Mwangi, why does that matter? Why is it important that actually we have that sort of inclusion in leadership? On the table in the menu, if young people are not involved in decision making, that means that their interests and what they care about is not debated or discussed. But the reason why you have an uh, aging uh, people in parliament and in power and in the highest office because they've been able to consolidate power and become the gatekeepers of power. They control the political parties, uh, they control the resources and they control who gets where. And that's the reason why young people must decide by themselves to get involved in politics by forming their own political parties and their own political movements because power is not given. No one is going to give young people power and tell them here is the leadership position, become the president, become the prime minister. You have to fight for those positions. And these old people understand that they fought for those things that don't let them go. So young people must be ready to fight for those positions and take over. The other thing I think is lack of political education. Young people don't understand why they should care about politics. So, um, Ms. Abiola, what has been your experience of trying to get into uh, political leadership and contest for political office in Nigeria? Well, for me, I would, I would say that running for office has been the most enlightening experience of my entire life. Um, I'm a lot more aware of my people's challenges, just how serious they are and exactly what needs to be done, where and how, when it comes to um, fixing those challenges in our communities. I come from a constituency with three local governments uh, and about 38 wards, and most of my wards are rural, uh, so it, it kind of gives you an idea of just how much work needs to be done in those places. And then, of course, um, the key takeaway from campaigning, I would say, is that it is a terribly expensive process. Um, from getting people together, going to places, holding meetings, everything costs money. And um, I would say that the major um, campaign expense that people would have it's not even, you know, the, the official campaign costs like posters and billboards and media spend and souvenirs. It's more about mobilization, getting people together, holding meetings, consultations, stakeholder engagements. That's actually what takes the bulk of campaign expenses. 
Uh, I'm zeroing it down now to, um, you know, young people. I'm, I'm a young person. I'm a woman. I stand at the intersection of both um, groups. And I would say that one key challenge that a lot of young people have is what I mentioned earlier, the issue of the cost of pol political participation, especially when it comes to buying for elective office. It's also the same challenge with women who happen to be at, a dis um, at an economic disadvantage due to a number of factors. And... Um, uh, for me, I was able to, I, I, I invested a lot of personal funds. And then, of course, I was able to rally friends and mentors and people that I look up to, leaders, uh, basically, together, who really supported my campaign. And I can only imagine how much more difficult that process would have been for people who didn't have such a strong support system. So um, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And then coming now to the... Um, political party system, uh, from time to time, there are um, some difficult um, local uh, complications that inform certain decisions that people make in the um, runoff to the election cycle. And then, of course, another issue I experienced is violence. Um, there, was the, there, were, there were a number of incidents a couple of times I've, I've had to replace property for a number of supporters who were attacked. Some had their cars damaged, some were attacked physically, but I'm just really thankful that at least no lives were lost and um, we're able to contain it at a point, we're able to manage the situation and we're able to go ahead with the campaign. So it was it was a huge learning process for me. It's an experience that I will always be thankful for. And um, it's something that, will, that also has been um, informing my interventions back home, I will continue to do so uh, for as long as I intend to contribute to developing my community. And when you talk to young people in Africa, people we classify as youth, they're very vocal about what they see as the failure of leadership. Um, on social media, you know, you hear the criticism. And yet when you kind of look at practical involvement in the political process, they're mostly absent. It seems as if there's apathy when it comes to engaging with the process that throws up people who are in leadership positions politically. What do you think is responsible for this? You no, know, the apathy is that because there is uh, this fear. So for you to be able to do politics, you must be ready to do the rough and the dirty of politics. And the other thing is actually, they feel they don't have the money to do that. And that's why I was going back to political education because when you, when you have masses who are politically educated, they'll make demands and when those demands are not met, they're going to take those positions and make sure the demands are fulfilled. So the reason why, let me give an example with, with uh, Egypt. There was the Egyptian revolution that happened in Tahrir Square. So when you go on social media and you whine and you tweet and you complain about a problem and you leave it there, it won't fix itself. So there must be a next step. And when you have a political education, understand different level of representation. And when all that fails, you become your own representative. And it goes back to the political parties and their owners and the masters. Right. All big political right. parties belong to old men who formed them maybe 50 years ago, 30 years ago. And then you have dynasties where someone dies, then the son becomes a prime minister or a member of parliament, or someone dies and their wife is given that position. Actually, in Kenya, we say uh, some political parties have sexually transmitted positions because... Mm -hmm. Because you come from the same bloodline, you must be given that particular seat. So the apathy is just a small thing, but the apathy has many, many multiple issues underlying that. Apart from the issue of the exclusion of young people, there's also a gender exclusion that seems to be very mainstream um, within African countries. So a lot of women don't get a look in. If I could ask um, uh, Dr. Mohammed, what is your experience in Ghana of female participation in politics and what have been the obstacles to allowing women to fully um, take part in the political process? Uh, there are so many issues with regards to that and some of them are actually related to what Boniface mentioned uh, with the issue of apathy, uh, you know, perceptions about what politics is. People think in Ghana there is the common perception that politics is a dirty game. So if you participate in it, you you must, you know, like playing in debt. Um, there's also the issue of gatekeeping, which he also mentioned, where there are specific people who sort of guard the doors as far as political participation is concerned. And so many of the things that affect youth um, apathy or youth participation in politics um, can be connected to female participation in politics. And the reason why we still have that issue 
um, in Ghana is also because of the way that women politicians are treated, the way that women politicians are scrutinized. For example, recently, um, Ghana had our first female vice presidential nominee for a major um, political party. She's not the first ever, but just for a major political party. And from observing the way that um, she has been discussed in the public sphere, you will understand why a lot of women are a little bit, you know, skeptical about being within the political sphere. Can you be a bit specific about some of the, um, um, what is being said? Yes, I was, I was just going to that. Yes. So one of the things that, you know, happened was that they were scrutinizing, you know, her family and asking if she was married. People were interested in her marital status, whether she was married or single. And uh, people were asking whether, you know, we can have a, can we have a woman leader, you know, and people would, they would even connect it to women's reproductive health and say, oh, women are emotional. Women shouldn't be in leadership positions and all of that. And it's interesting to see that a lot of the people who attack women in political uh, positions are usually opposition. Men from opposition parties are the ones that usually will attack, you know, women who are trying to participate in, in party politics. Another reason why we've had very little female uh, participation is because of the idea of pigeonholing. So when I say pigeonholing, I mean that in many political parties in Ghana, women are relegated to the women's wing of the party where, you know, that is the only wing that women are encouraged to sort of run for um, internal party positions. So the women's organizer's position, of course, is a women's position. You don't see a woman uh, or you don't see women being encouraged to run for the chairman of the or the chairperson of the party. You don't see them being encouraged to run for like the secretary of the party and all of these other positions. So when we pigeonhole women in that way, we are telling them essentially that there are specific positions within the political party dynamics that they can only run for and they are not really invited to break out of that mode. And that also translates in the people that are put forward to um, run for the primaries at you know the constituency level, right? So if women are not encouraged to hold leadership positions within the party, how does that translate into actual political um, you know, activity at the grassroots level, at the constituency level, and even at the presidential level. Why are we finding it very difficult within this continent to convince, if you like, uh, the men who are in positions of authority that inclusion actually is better for everybody? And that is a bit like fighting with one hand behind, tied behind your back if you're trying to govern and you're excluding a sizable section of your population, whether it is sort of the 50% that is sort of uh, female or whether it is the sort of 70% in, in many places where they're young people. Why is it a problem? I think that the major problem is that most politicians or most male politicians are interested in winning. I mean, any politician at all is interested in winning. And there is this deep-seated idea that uh, women are not winnable candidates. And I think that the reason why they can push forward the argument that women are not winnable candidates is because at the electorate level, at the grassroots level, at the level where individuals go out to vote, there is the wide belief that women cannot hold leadership positions. Women are too emotional to run uh, you know, the state of affairs or women should not be leaders at all. And I, it definitely connects to the patriarchy and both um, ideas sort of reinforce each other. If you have a larger system, that supports the idea that women shouldn't hold leadership positions. You are justified in using that to make an argument that, you know, they are not supposed to lead. And so if we put them forward, the larger population will not support them. And it also ties back beyond the patriarchy to a lot of our uh, institutions and how they are tied to the patriarchy. In our educational institutions, the legal institutions, the political religious institutions are every day telling us that, women are not fit to hold leadership positions. So you'll see that all these institutions within our countries work in tandem to, to pu push women further to the periphery and to discourage them from participating in politics. So we need to do a lot of work um, with regards to reconstituting or reimagining these institutions to the point where uh, we try to dismantle these harmful ideas that we see emerging out of these institutions that support and, and, um, yeah, and, and I, I think we will talk a little bit about what needs to happen if things are to change obviously we, we're talking there about the difficulty of um using existing systems to 
change the status quo as you found out um, when you tried to get the ticket of your party, which um, is Nigeria's ruling party now to contest for political office. What did that process teach you about trying to assume leadership positions within existing structures? What I would say is that there has to be respect for democratic principles. Um, our democracy was hard fought. And uh, we all have to do whatever we can as citizens to see to it that it is preserved. Uh, you know, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's often said that um, uh, the price of uh, liberty is um, eternal vigilance. And as citizens, as political actors, we all have to be eternally vigilant to ensure that the democratic system is protected and that things are done in accordance with due process. Now, um, I, I made reference to some difficult local political complications earlier. And um, as you stated in your question, that also happened in my case. I ended up running on the platform of, an, of another party. One thing I would like to say, however, is that, you know, um, eventually the, the, the situation was controlled and, um, you know, sanity was restored. Um, and um, it's, it's one of the reasons why after the elections, I returned to the APC. And I'm actually very thankful to the national leaders of the party for intervening and ensuring that um, democratic principles were obeyed um, in the end. And um, um, now within seeking a political office within existing structures, Mainstream political parties present a number of advantages that smaller ones don't. And one of those is a very well-established structure. And you're also more likely to have support from other candidates who are within that political party system. However, if you look at a state like Ondo, where we have um, legislators, both in the state house and the federal house of representatives, where, where, where we have legislators from minority parties, it also shows that it is not something that is not doable. Some people are able to get into the electoral system using um, smaller political parties, while in other cases, it's a lot more challenging. Generally, it is a lot more challenging. And you're, you're going to have to, to invest a lot of resources, more resources than you normally would if you were running on a more established platform. Now, um, what I would encourage generally is for uh, young people and women who intend to run, uh, do more to build more on whatever momentum you've been able to gain at home. If there is really no um, support base just here to work on building that so that irrespective of what um, uh, platform you run on, it's, it's a bit, um, would I say easier? It doesn't guarantee that you will be elected, but it, it, it contributes somewhat um, towards making the campaigning process a little less strenuous. And um, um, with uh, established political parties, it's not impossible, of course, candidates emerge all the time. It's just that um, we have to ensure that we hold our leaders to account at every stage. And as I said earlier, I'm very happy that the national leadership of the APC was able to intervene and ensure that due process was followed. There's something that is sort of um, um, similar to the way um, women are excluded that is also true for the way young people are excluded. And it is this singular fact that in elections, young people and women actually form a sizable um, part of the electorate. So they have the votes. And so sometimes when you have that conversation, you wonder whether why it is so difficult for young people themselves and women themselves to exercise what you might call enlightened self-interest and actually you know, vote for either female candidates or candidates of people that are younger. And from your experience in Kenya, what are the issues as far as that is concerned, translating that demographic strength into some sort of victory in the political process? So I'll start with the women, the women question. And what Kenya tried to do about that is to get a law that says a third of the people elected in office should be women. So parties must nominate women to vie for elective posts. And that has been the constitution for the last uh, 10 years and they, it hasn't been fulfilled yet. So last week, the chief justice sent uh, an adversary letter to the president saying that you must dissolve parliament for failing to meet the third gender rule, which they haven't met. So the, there's actually a crisis in the country and they might they, they, they'll be forced to get a political solution to that problem because you cannot keep on ignoring women and not electing women. And patriarchy is to blame for that. If you dismantle patriarchy, then you dismantle that very bad habit of hating women, not electing women, and excluding women from uh, positions of power. Talking about young people, 
and women and why they can't get elected and why they can't be able to uh, fill their own candidates. And money is a big factor. So most young people will go where the money is. And the old guards and the old guard at the top have the money. And so they know that when you have money, you can buy influence. If you look at many political parties, I don't know about Nigeria, but I know about Kenya, the biggest political parties in this country have no ideology. If you ask me what they stand for, they stand for nothing. But the guys at the top are billionaires, and they use that money to buy power. And this is actually a place to the US where Trump has no ideology, he's a hateful person, but he's still the president. And that's the role of money in politics. So I was saying that money plays a big issue. The other thing that I learned as a candidate, because I fight for an elective office, is that poor people hate poor people. <laughs> poor people want to see a rich man and say, I admire that person and I hope that he can become like that one, that person. And they also feel like that if I vote for a rich person, they might give me handouts. As a poor person vine, as a woman vine, and you don't have money to give out uh, flour and sugar and salt, and cooking oil, people are like, no, he's a poor person. They even laugh at you. That's the reason why most politicians live a very flamboyant life. Yes. And, they, and it's very deliberate. They're trying to create impressions. And so... Africans, and I have to be very specific about Africans, must stop respecting money and people with money because that's the reason why we are where we are today. We have a habit of glorifying thieves and people with a lot of money and despising the people with ideas. So the people who have ideas have no money and they can't, they can't get elected. But the people with money have no ideas, but they do bribe to get elected. So if we remove the money factor from politics, we we'll even have female presidents across the continent. There is a mindset issue to begin with before we even get to sort of the practical issues about how to raise funds and how to break into maybe political parties. So what is the starting point there for getting young Africans and women and the generality of people to sort of start thinking differently about this? Hmm. I think that we have a lot of um, education work to do um, because like Boniface said, uh, and I have seen this and I know people who have experienced this personally where, you know, the elected officials, most of the time they don't do much in their communities. But when it's like a few months, uh, you know, to elections, they come and then give handouts and they are the ones that get voted into power. And I've actually witnessed a situation where a specific member of parliament who, you know, uh, or, or an elected official who like worked towards bringing developmental projects to his community, was not and 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 he did you know he he worked towards bringing developmental projects to his community and he didn't really participate in the politics of giving handouts to to people um you know almost lost an election because the people did not value what he was doing uh for in the long run so one of the problems that we have is well we have a problem of poverty where people don't have access to resources and so i understand why they would vote for someone who would give them a bag of rice or a bag of sugar over someone who would maybe say build a school because those are their immediate needs. But we need to do a lot of education at the level, you know, at the grassroots level to, to get people to think about the ways that political leaders or elected officials can bring about long-term development in their communities. And I think that sort of work can be done through collaborating with, um, you know, opinion leaders in these communities, like, you know, traditional leaders, the chiefs of these communities and, you know, assembly members and all of these uh, um, opinion leaders, we need to collaborate with them at that level and provide extensive political education about the, the roles and responsibilities of elected officials um, and also try and get them to think about what the, they can benefit from in the long term from their elected officials. But in order for that to happen too, we need to work uh, and build a system where um, poor people do not tend to like we need to build a system where poor people are not further marginalized, where they um, have no other option than to go for the handouts rather than elect officials who are actually interested in the betterment of their communities. So it's it's a very difficult um, situation to be in. Now, often when we, we have these conversations around inclusion, particularly around gender and age, um, critics of this conversation um, will point out that um, electing women and electing young people doesn't automatically translate to better governance, um, they would argue. Yeah. And if you look at, for an example, for, um, the last elections we had, we had a group that campaigned vigorously and got signed into law 
um, a law that was essentially designed to allow younger people to contest for some of the highest offices in the land is we got a bill called the not too young to run bill and one of the beneficiaries of that bill who ended up in the senate was caught on camera physically assaulting a woman and he's turned out to be generally a disgraceful character sitting in the senate even though he's a young person and so sometimes people point to that and say well you guys keep campaigning for inclusion on the basis of either gender on the basis of because it is true it doesn't automatically translate to better does it better does it no no it doesn't um the political um ideologies or or the the the, the way that these people think definitely impacts um, the policies that they end up working on. And so it's important that when we think about including marginalized people, inclusion is important, representation is important, but we also have to think about the, the quality of inclusion um, that we are getting, the quality of the representation that we are getting. You don't just vote any person into power because you know they're a woman or they're young, but you also have to examine their politics and what they will or what they can do when they get into leadership positions. And that's how sometimes we have, you know, women, uh, you know, voted into leadership positions who go in and, you know, do exactly what um, the establishment has been doing for a long time. So in order to uh, realize this um, goal of trying to be inclusive of both women and young people, we also have to provide education about the quality of representation that we are looking at and make it clear that you know when people that we are trying to get into these positions are elected, there are certain expectations that we have of them. They are not expected to go and be part of the establishment and just you know roll with whatever is going on there. They are expected to get in there and bring the new ideas that come with youthfulness and the new ideas that come with you know the experience of woman being a woman and bringing these ideas into the mainstream and making sure that these ideas um, bring about change for not just um, people that from the group that you're in, but for the larger, you know, society. So we also have to examine the quality of representation that we are getting, because if you're electing a woman to go into uh, parliament or to go into a position of power to um, take us back, you know, to, to destroy policies that have improved the lives of women, I, then I don't even see the point of it. Let me bring in Mr. Mwangi here, um, and I want you to talk to us about your experience in Kenya. Um, it, how have you sort of, because you run for office, how have you navigated this paradox of trying to um, get into the political process, whether it is as an elected official or supporting other people to get into office without getting sucked into becoming part of the establishment, which many see as the problem? So let's say this about being a youth. So being a youth is not a platform and you can't run on a platform of youth. You have to run, run on a platform of ideas. Uh, the struggle for this continent and our independence was won by young people. Uh, we had Darren Kimad in Kenya, Tom Boyer, Pio Gamapinto. Uh, globally, you had Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we had Sankara, Amika Cabral, all those were young people. And they fought for what they believed and died for that. So historically, the, the freedom for any country has been won by its young people, and you cannot liberate the continent without young people. Now, how how did I get into politics? So when I was vying, I did not have any money. I was vying. Uh, we had formed our own political party called Ukweli Party, which means the Truth Party. And then we realized we did not have any money to be able to finance the candidates that were vying. And what we decided to do, we realized our continent is very prayerful. So people go to the most on Friday, others go to the church on Sunday or the synagogues on Saturday. There's a lot of worship across this country, continent. And every weekend, people give their pastors money and their prophets and their sheikhs and whatever leader that uh, gives you spiritual nourishment. So what we did, we told guys, we are vying to represent you and we're going to work for you. And if you fund our campaign, we're going to work for you because you own us. If someone comes and gives you money, they own you. But if you fund my campaign, you're funding me to go and work for you. So I'm answerable to you. That, that's what I did. So I raised money for myself, uh, for my candidacy, about $150,000, uh, which did my entire campaign. And then I was able to raise money for the political party and our candidates. Uh, there was a lot of irregularities, as you know, in African politics, and we did not win a single seat. But we also taught people that we could actually run a very clean campaign because African politics is like a very dirty, polluted river. But there's no way you can empty a river. The only way to clean a polluted river is by adding clean water. 
So every time a new candidate buys and they're clean and they're clean and they're clean and they're clean, they're helping push out the debris to the ocean and add enough fresh water. So the whole idea for Africans getting involved in politics is just young Africans, that is, to form their own political parties and change the game because you cannot change the rules of the old parties or the old guards and they'll not work with you. The conversation around um, um, reform, often when you talk to people, they say to you, well, there's not enough young people, not enough women getting involved in uh, political parties and across the continent, and that perhaps the way to do it is to become members of the party. But often we find the problem starts before you even get to the polls, because internal party democracy is missing thing in many um, parties across Africa. And so what I seem to hear you say is, do not play their game, set up your own structures and be able to, to challenge what is already existing. The problem yes. with that is that it takes time. And that is why people sort of get a bit discouraged because they feel like they're doing these things and they're not seeing any progress. I hear that a lot. And when I became an activist, I thought that it's changes like a mic, it's something microwave. You put it in the microwave, five minutes, it's ready, and then you eat it. But change is a marathon, and you it's not a sprint. So you have to pass on the baton for the marathon to go to finish. So we must start the cleansing of our politics by doing clean politics and performing political parties and building those political parties. Because you cannot complain about the bad parties and join those bad political parties. There's no way you can swim in a sewer rage and come out smelling clean. So don't go to consume in the sewer. Form your own political party and fight for it and ensure that even if you don't get elected, your grandchild will get elected. The, the independence for Africa took about 50, 50, 60, 70 years. So eventually it's progressive. Change is progressive. America waited for a black president. But when they slept a bit like this, another guy who's a demagogue came and became president. So even if we achieve the change we want today, and we don't guard it, you're going to lose it. So don't join those dirty political parties, form your own parties, do the hard work, and perhaps you'll see the fruit of your, your, your labor, but your child and your grandson, they'll see that. So don't get into the change process, thinking it's gonna be an event. Change is never an event, where you cut the ribbon, then you go home, then it's over. <coughs> change comes by fighting every single day and protecting the gains and then keep on advancing those things. And I can guarantee you, by the time you're dying, we'll, have it, we'll be having similar conversations, but we'll have gained some incremental change. Ghana has a female vice president. She may, she may become president. Maybe the girl who's at the top is going to die. Automatically, she becomes president. Then she becomes <laughs> a vice president. Do you agree with him about um, the fact that this is a long game and that people need to stop looking for instant gratification? Yes. I do. I do agree. And I'm just going to use an example of the Economic Fighters um, League, which is a, young, a group of young people who were part of the Convention People's Party, the CPP. That was the party that, you know, uh, Nkrumah's party. And they saw that they did not like the way that the party was being run and the dynamic of the party in, you know, uh, current times. And so these young people broke away and they formed their own organization, even though they call it nonpartisan, it's one of the most vibrant um, organizing and activist, political, social and political activist groups in Ghana currently. And um, they have done that because they thought about, you know, the long term. They didn't say, oh, we're just going to stick it out and stay in this party and see what happens. They broke away, started their own organization, which they say is nonpartisan. And they've been doing so much work and um, re, they are reawakening like the consciousness of Ghanaians with regards to holding party officials accountable. Um, so this group in collaboration with the women, with, with a bunch of women, held the state accountable for their um, actions to take that would adversely affect the country. So one of the things that this group has worked to do together with these women who was, um, was that they had um, the government of Ghana or the parliament of Ghana decided that they wanted to build a new parliamentary chamber to conduct parliamentary affairs and spent $200 million on this project. So this particular group uh, was convened, or this movement was convened by Rashida Adams and other women from all you know, 
backgrounds within the Ghanaian um, space, you know, different religions, different ethnicities across the country, and they helped mobilize a vibrant movement to hold the state accountable. It was really an amazing thing to see. So what they did was they came together and they started a hashtag called Drop That Chamber. And so when they started the hashtag, people started talking about what the $200 million could have been used for. And then they, they were like um, connecting in photos of like children who were studying under trees because they didn't have school buildings to study in, um, communities that had terrible roads, communities that did not have potable water for people to drink. And so this movement, it became huge to the point where um, people across the country were tweeting about it and were holding the, the government accountable. And they had planned to even have a march, like an actual march uh, through the principal streets of Accra. And they, before they even had to go for the march, the, the parliament and the, leader, the leadership of parliament came out and said they were suspending that idea and that they were no longer going to um, build a $200 million parliament. So this is what happens when young people you know, work together across social backgrounds. Given some of the issues we see within the Nigerian political space, especially as it relates to getting young people and women into uh, positions of authority, elective office, um, are you hopeful at all that things will change? And if they're to change, what are the things that um, regular people must do in order to sort of ensure this change? So basically, yeah, Nigeria is a country for all of us. And if we are going to change the political system, if we're going to make um, polit politicians um, answerable to the people, more accountable, then we all have to value participation. Because when you participate in elections, you're performing your civic duty. Voting is like a social contract of sorts. When you vote for somebody, you're in a contract with them. They're, they're, they're accountable to you. They're there to serve you, to protect your interests. And for as long as the majority of the people shy away from this um, very important duty, we're not going to have the kind of um, mass that we need to be able to exert pressure on our elected and appointed officials. So as, as citizens, we, we, we have to hold up our end of the bargain by actually participating in the process. I see no reason why any Nigerian over the age of 18 should refuse to vote you know, I see no reason why any Nigerian who is of voting age should refuse to register if they don't have a PVC. So these are all things that we all have to be a, a lot more involved in. We have associations, teachers. Uh, I actually hear a lot of young people complain about how the um, National Union of Road Transport Workers, for instance, seems to exert too much pressure on government or how market women seem to have too much influence. But the thing is, politics is a game of numbers and it's people who can deliver on these numbers that have a say in how things are done within their communities. So for as long as people think they are too good to engage the system or that they are too good to participate in the process or that they are too good to, to decide on who to vote for, we're going to be having the same challenges. We shouldn't have a middle class that is not participating actively in shaping the affairs of our country. And the very first step to doing that is to register to vote and participate in elections. There is no way when we're, 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 we're going to be able to change the narrative of politics in Nigeria if we're not involved in the process. I joined politics because I decided that um, um, I wanted to be able to do more. I, I, I made the cross from activism to mainstream politics because I figured there's only so much one can do, you know, maybe running an NGO or as an individual or as one activist. And, you know, compared to what you'll be able to, to, to achieve within the political system. And that was why I joined politics. Now, I, 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 I acknowledge that not everybody will be a politician, but if you're not actively involved in politics, you need to be a more active citizen. Engage your elected representatives. Engage your appointed um, officials. Engage the system. If you're dissatisfied with something, speak up about it. I'm particularly happy about young people who are marching in their numbers across cities in Nigeria, demanding an end to the to to SARS. Uh, there have been many cases of police brutality. These are the kind of engagements that we need to sustain so that our voices are heard. Process peacefully, write your legislators, make your stand um, known, make your voice heard. We need to be able to amplify each other's voices and speak to what the issues are. So if, if, we, if we really desire change, if we really want things to be done differently, then it's either one, we join politics, or two, we become more active citizens so that we hold our politicians to account. We cannot afford 
to not be concerned about how our country is run and then complain when things aren't being done properly. So it's, it's, it's a project that everybody has to be involved in. And I really just want to encourage as many young people, as many women, as many Nigerians as possible to know that, um, you know, they have to participate in this process. At the start yeah. of the, the pandemic, we had Nigeria's parliament actually ordering brand new cars worth billions and they're not listening to anybody about their expenditure. So they're consuming a large chunk of our resources and we've not seen any attempt to cut down on the number and that you're mentioning, which are sort of also very evident here. So for example, you talked about people uniting across ethnic and religious lines. And I'm finding in a place like Nigeria, for example, politicians keep talking our fault lines. And we mm -hmm. don't see to have an answer to that because um, it's almost like with a, like a ventriloquist who is controlling his doll. Every time they do it, people true to form actually just line up. And I don't think it's a problem peculiar to Nigeria. I know more about Nigeria because I'm here. So how do we even begin to ensure that um, there is unity among the common man to face politicians who are so ruthless and so determined to hang on to power or to get into positions of authority that they do not mind using religion, they do not mind using tribes, all the things that traditionally have been used to, to keep people apart. How do we deal with that, that thing that is sort of so, so central to the way Africans do their politics? I think that we can start with coalition building. And this uh, example I just showed you with the Drop That Chamber movement did exactly that. So they were working with people across um, various organizations. And um, another thing that I think that we need to do is to strengthen organizing at the local level. Most people uh, sit back and do not participate in social uh, activism or political activism because they think that it's people is the job for, you know, the job of people in a crowd to do. But if you have uh, people working at the local level to hold people accountable in each region of the country, when something like that comes up where um, there seems to be parliamentarians trying to involve in corruption or misappropriate funds, all these local organizations that have been built across the regions can come together and work you know, as a big coalition to hold these uh, institutions accountable. And I think that there is a general consensus across the nation that neither the new patriotic party, uh, the NPP, nor the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, which are the two major political parties, neither of them have the best interests, interests of Ghanaians at heart in the long run. You know, so we, we there's this running joke that, you know, each of them just come and chop and leave, you know, it's like a turn taking thing that they do. So the fact that we have, we all have this understanding that neither of them are interested in doing the work that we expect them to do. We need to start working across regions, across borders, across, you know, um, ethnicities to bring um, organizations together into a big coalition to hold this, these people accountable. And I think the reason why the Parliamentarians were scared into dropping that idea of spending two hundred million dollars on a on a parliament chamber was because of the strength of the movement. They saw that it wasn't just a bunch of like you know like ten fifteen people in Accra talking about it. It wasn't just you know a few people talking about it. They saw when they saw the conversations on social media, it was crazy. If you go and click that hashtag, there are thousands and thousands of tweets from people across regions, when you check, you know, their locations, it wasn't just a crowd. So that showed them that if they did not, and you know, all these politicians, it was both people, people from both parties who wanted the, the parliament. So it wasn't even just one party. So when they noticed that they realized that it would harm them. And so they were like, okay, we need to listen to what these people are doing. So we need to do more work, local organizing and coalition building. Mr. Mwangi, in Kenya, are these um, fault lines still coming to the fore in the politics? And how have you, you know, tried to navigate this in sort of setting up your structures and in going to the people? So the lines have been there, and I think it applies to every African country. Uh, it's part of the remnants of colonization, the divide and rule. So the biggest political leaders in, in the continent organize along ethnic lines. And so people do not see themselves as Kenyans, they see themselves as a Kikuyu, a Luo, a Kalenjin, whatever tribe you are, and then you see yourself as Kenyan next. And the whole idea is, what we're trying to do is unite poor people, like poor people should be united by their poverty, because there are only two tribes in the continent. Uh, they have and have nots, the rich and the poor. So what we're trying to do, and as she said, 
uh, Dr. Mohammed, is actually you need to organize people on local wards. So you organize people around issues. If you have a water problem, come together on that particular issue. A uh, good example, there's a place in Northern Kenya called Wajia, where they, have, they haven't had clean water since, since the memorial. So what did they do? They organized a public meeting, like a public baraza, where everyone came for the meeting, and the leaders were there. Then they brought out their drinking water and said, you are our leaders, you represent us, drink our water. And the leaders refused to drink that water, and they promised to drink for them both. So if you, if you get people at the very local level to understand the problems and how they can be solved by unity, then they're going to do that. The work that you're both doing. If I was to ask you to put together like a manifesto that allows us to sort of begin to work with communities across the continent on inclusion, both in terms of gender, but also in terms of um, age, that's a young people. What are the sort of things that you would put in place? Would it be to say to people, well, actually start from sort of small groups, community organization, um, before you sort of try to influence things at the national level? Or is it a question of you can do both at the same time? I mean, what would be the must do things for a manifesto that is designed to get young people and women involved in governance and that forces us perhaps to, to start putting merit ahead of everything else? Because there are many who believe if you did that, naturally there will be more inclusion. Oh, change is bottom up. So change begins at the very, very low, low level. If you teach someone to hold someone accountable at the very basic level, whether it's a pastor or the water vendor, whether it is a very local level, uh, gradually they get the muscle to be to actually hold the top tier leadership to, to account for the whatever they're doing. So how do you do this? Organize people around their interest. So you have the guys who who drive motorbikes, they have interest. How do you organize them around that? Uh, church groups, women groups. Uh, teachers, doctors, and when you get them in those groups of them and tell them, you need to outline your problem, and then you must get the enemy of that problem, and then see how you can address that particular problem. Who does the organizing? How do you get people interested enough to drop the apathy and begin to understand that they must get engaged? Also a manifesto for people like you, really. No, you, you don't need any freaking book. There's no... There's no Messiah or Jesus or Mohammed or Buddha, whoever is going to come and save you. There's none like that. And that's all saying. So people must be brought together by their problems. You have a problem, come together and say, this is our problem. And this is the person making this problem exist. So the simple things you can do. You can name, on sh name and shame online. You can say this person is not work very well and organize to get, go get votes, like get a voter's card and get one of your own to get elected and hold them accountable. You see, they, when you were growing up, can I give a quick story? Yes, absolutely. When I was growing up, my grandmother used to tell us about, don't go to that place, that person is a witch. Don't go to that place, that person is a thief. We must name our thieves and our witches in the community. So the people who have been stealing our money and looting our money, it's not enough to just say, uh, give them an amorphous name or call them a, and say it's corruption. We just say, Boniface Mong is corrupt, and you name me and shame me. That is number one. Number two, which is very key, there's no devil or, or God in this conversation. The whole idea of me to pray my problems away should not exist because in this continent, we pray more than Europe and more than any other continent in the world, but you have more problems. And you told us the devil, it's God. There's nothing like that because the day you vote, the devil is not on the ballot. God is not on the ballot. Those people don't exist in this conversation. There's no devil bank of Nigeria or devil bank of Kenya or go back of Kenya. The people who are stealing our money and stealing the money abroad are people that we know. So we must start naming our enemies. The same way you name cancer and you name HIV AIDS and corona, we must let name me, those people. Let me ask you yes. about something that is a little bit controversial, particularly when it yes. comes to this continent and because you've touched on it. Do you believe that the fact that we've become really religious has done a very big disservice to our ability to actually solve our problems? Yes. And that, there lies the point. Religion has become a pacifier. That you're told when you're in problem, oh, inshallah, it's God's will, it's God's will. It's not God's will for you to be to have problems. You're told there's a heaven. The heaven is right here. Why does your president and your member of parliament have a heaven right here and they live like heaven and they're living in poverty? Why can't they come and live like us if there's a heaven? The heaven is right here. So people 
have decided to blame and pass the responsibility to God or the devil or some other thing out there. There's no other thing out there stealing mm -hmm. our money. It's right here. So what should Africans do? Pray less and work more. Pray to God by tying your camel. You have a responsibility because there's no way Jesus is going to come and carry a placard for you. You don't do that. You don't come and vote for you. You don't do that. So you become your own Jesus, become your own Mohammed, take responsibility because that heaven, no one has been there and come back and told us it's there. So why do you want to postpone your, your, your good life to the future when well, the people that you elect are living it right now? So listen to this. Do we need to convince um, religious leaders, leaders of churches, leaders of mosques, which are so influential, to become political? And I ask this because in places like South America, traditionally we've seen the roles that churches have played, for example, in liberation struggles and in fighting for the rights of regular people. Um, is this something that perhaps we need to tap into as opposed to sort of fighting, so sort of convincing no, the, the, um, religious leaders that they must be part of the solution? Or you think that is um, something that is a pipe dream and they would never do anything like that because they're part of the problem? They're part of the problem. They teach us to turn the other cheek. They teach us to pray for our enemies. They tell us to pray for those who abuse us and oppress us. No, 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 no. Let us dismantle the churches, the mosques, and anybody that tells us to turn the other cheek. For how long are we going to turn the other cheek? Hmm. We have no cheek to turn anymore. So we need to tax churches and tell them to pay taxes as well so that they actually start talking about how we are living in very poor lives. The problem we have in this continent, we have more religion than common sense. It might take a long while for us to happened to the idea of religious be leaders being the agents of change um, because yes like Boniface said a lot of the time they are part of the problem um, but I've also seen the potential that they have to bring about change so for example I'll take the national uh, imam of Ghana uh, as an example who has served as you know an agent of, of change and peace and all of that and he has done a great job um, you know, working across the religious divide to ensure that um, Muslims and Christians and um, worshippers of, you know, African traditional religions have a good relationship. So there is the possibility, the potential for them uh, to be agents of change. But I think that asking Africans to divest from religion, I think it's a wonderful thing, but I'm not sure that um, a lot of people, so many people are very committed to their religions to the point where when you ask them to divest from from the institution of religion, it is like you're asking them to, to um, be blasphemers, right? So I think that one of the ways that we can rethink our relationship with religion as Africans is to sort of seek knowledge for ourselves. Because a lot of the time, like Boniface said, our religious leaders, they, are, they don't do the, job, the work that they should be doing to you know, help improve the lives of you know, followers of the religion. A lot of the time, the religious leaders are not helping because they put ideas into people's heads and they're telling them not to take action outside of, you know, um, being spiritual and practicing their religions. So I'll say that it, it's, um, it is on individuals to, if you still want to be invested in religion, to seek knowledge for yourself and not always depend on your pastor or your imam to interpret religious doctrines to you. Because um, a lot of the time, the, 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 the interpretations are colored by the prejudices of these religious um, leaders and how they are positioned in society. Um, and I would say that as far as organizing is concerned, when we think about gender and age, one of the things that we also have to think about is how to dismantle elitism within the political sphere in our own country. So many people tend to think about partisan politics and they think about, you know, an elite group of people. And I mean, it, it, it is obvious. It, it makes sense that they think of it that way because um, our current president is from a political family. You know, they have been political. His family has been political leaders for the country for, for some time now. And so I understand why, you know, the people would be apathetic as far as, um, you know, the, the constitution of leadership is concerned. So we need to dismantle the elitism embedded in our political system. And that can also start with making sure that political action, political activism is accessible to all, right? So if you are doing activism in the digital sphere, you have to think about how you can reach out to people who do not have mobile phones, people who do not have the technology to participate in that type of activism. 
And that means that your activism has to also translate into the physical world. You know, it also has to translate into like marches and going door to door to provide education or involve people or get people to uh, become involved in politics at the grassroots level. It might also even mean that you make your activist work or the, the work that you're doing more accessible to people in indigenous languages and not just in English because, you know, it's the national language. And so there are so many things that we need to do, strategies that we need to employ to dismantle some of these things. Some of them is elitism and classism because, you know, half the time when we do organizing, we are looking at like-minded people, you know, people who share the same ideas, which is great, but we also need to recruit and involve people who are not necessarily interested in the work that we are doing. And like Boniface said, we have to organize around issues that they care about. If you come to my community and I don't have portable drinking water or my children go to study under trees instead of inside classrooms, you have to tell me what, you know, participating in this type of organizing is going to do for me and my community and what I can do, uh, uh, you know, how I can assert my own agency to be able to realize this. So I think that we need to break all the barriers that we have beyond ethnicity and religion, but also we have to think about class and the idea of elitism and how it's deeply embedded in our political system. And that also ties to the idea of gatekeeping, where you know that if you're not from a political family, it's hard for you to break into, you know, the political mode and even be considered for, a, you know, a nomination for like a primary or a presidential um, election. Obviously, um, on our continent, there is a real danger for people who sort of try to challenge the status quo. We've seen uh, politicians utilize all the resources at their disposal, including violence, sometimes state actors, to intimidate and try and get people who are bent on challenging their positions of authority um, dealt with. Um, I think uh, what comes to mind immediately is what happened in Rwanda with um, Diane Rugara, who contested against President Kagame and found herself in jail. So in terms of sort of just um, what are the sort of things that people can do to ensure that they protect themselves from people who are often ruthless about these things and are determined to protect their access to power using whatever means necessary. Uh, the struggle is not a picnic. So if you go to the to a protest, or if you want to bring about change, don't go there and serve you uh, salad and juice and give you a seat and, and tell you enjoy, and then there's a beautiful view. You know, the struggle, people have to bleed, uh, people will go to jail, some people are going to die, but that's the price that you pay uh, during a struggle. Now, the best weapon against an oppressor or a very bad person or a very bad government is nonviolence because you can't win against them when you start uh, armed revolution or you start using violence because now they have monopoly of violence and you're going to lose. So what you must be prepared that during this struggle, some of you are going to end up in jail and some are going to die. That's the price you pay. And that's the reason why I'll go back to what I said before. Political education will indicate you that the struggle has been there for thousands of years. And in every struggle, there must, there must be a price to pay, whether it's jail or death. But what, every time someone dies, uh, you're feeding the tree of liberty and it will sprout. So how do you organize? Nonviolence. Uh, we have social media. You can do your things online. You can do a protest that is peaceful. You respond with violence. And you're able to paint this person in the in the court of public opinion that they're actually a bad person or it's a bad government. So mm -hmm. do not expect to be met with roses when you go to a protest. It's gonna be tear gas, batons, dogs, and water cannons. But every time they do that to you, you're winning because you, you're not armed but they still respond with force. It's a tough dream to sell <laughs> that uh, Mr. Buwangi is trying to um, explain. And I, it's, it's the reality. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that it's often very difficult to convince people to put their lives on the line for things that are in their they believe are not tangible or that may not be realized in their lifetime. I certainly know that here in Nigeria, for example, we struggle to convince people to get active in sort of doing things for what they call Nigeria, because as far as they're concerned, um, Nigeria has let them down and they're not ready to put their lives down the way they put it for Nigeria. What are your thoughts regarding what he said and how you can sort of mitigate the harshness 
of that language in a way that allows people to engage. Yeah, I mean, uh, he Boniface makes very valid points. Uh, sometimes there has to be violence for there to be change, uh, which is valid. Uh, and if you look at a lot of these movements across the continent and across the world, that has been the case historically. Um, but there are also various strategies that people or uh, movements have um, have employed across societies to sort of address these issues. And uh, I think one of them we mentioned earlier is public shaming. You know. Um, but also public shaming has to work if the leaders have shame, right? Because sometimes, you know, people go out and protest and then they're like, we don't care and not much comes out of it. But public shaming has also um, served to be a useful tool to hold leaders accountable. Um, and I think that another thing that we need to pay attention to and draw more from is to learn from each other across the continent, you know, stand in solidarity with each other across the continent. So when Stella Nyanzi of um, Uganda was arrested over and over again and thrown in jail and all of that, you know, there were Ghanaians uh, who were part of political movements that would go out and protest and support her and everything. And then you saw that sort of support from various parts of the continent. It brought more attention to the issue. Um, and also the, the organizing that was done in Uganda itself helped with her, her situation. And I think that we can all learn from each other as far as um, protecting ourselves uh, at the basic level at protests is concerned. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement this past summer learned um, a lot from Palestinians about how to protect themselves from tear gas when you go to protest, you know, how to cover your face when you're protesting so that photos that are taken do not identify you and get you thrown in jail or get you in trouble. So there are all these strategies that various movements across the, the, the world have like employed and have learned from each other as far as, you know, um, protection at like the micro level is concerned. So I think that these are some of the things that we can learn from. Um, but at the basis level, it looks like um, if there has to be violence for a specific um, goal to be achieved, that is what has to happen. So we have, even when we look back on our liberation movements, we did not, you know, beg for uh, our independence, we had to fight for to, to be able to gain our independence. So we have to think about bringing about change in these ways. And if you relate the idea of um, achieving change or bringing about change to the people that you're working with, they are more inclined to, you know, maybe to some extent put their, themselves in harm's way to be able to uh, bring about the change that they want to see. So I think that we can learn from each other. Um, and we should, I think there needs to be more conversation within the continent because there are a lot of things that are happening in other parts of the continent that we don't know about. And the major reason is because of linguistic differences. So like, for example, a Ghanaian is more likely to know a lot about Nigeria, which is great than they are to know about Cote d'Ivoire or, or Togo, Burkina Faso, even though these are the countries that we share borders with. And these are also countries that are struggling, um, you know, for, for freedoms and also to dismantle systems that are oppressive to them. So we also need to think about, you know, how to communicate within these spaces and to learn from each other, irrespective of the language that we have as a national language um, within our countries. And um, it's interesting you say that because you are Ghanaian, of course, the home of Kwame Nkrumah, perhaps the last African leader to properly articulate the dream of Pan-Africanism. And so um, from that perspective of sort of, um, you know, um, have building a coalition across the co the continent. Do you think, Mr. Mwangi, that realistically there's a way in which movements across borders can be built in a way that enables um, one sort of movement in one country to support the other? Or are we are we just are these just dreams? Are we just is this just a talking shop? Are we just fooling ourselves in having this conversation? No, no, the movements are there. I was in Nigeria in twenty. I think 2018 for Not Too Young to Run, to celebrate the win and actually talk to the young people there. Uh, I work with guys in Uganda, in Nigeria, in Burkina Faso, in Senegal, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa. So there's actually a movement, but the movement is very young. So at the moment, you can't see the, you can't see the tree because the roots are first going down to get mm -hmm. that solidarity. And that's why Ghanaians are protesting about Selanyanzi. Yes. And when Bobby Wine was arrested, there were global protests about Bobby Wine. So globally, there's a movement, and there's even a connection between us and Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So we can't 
no thing, there's no connection. The connection is there. And it's much easier because of social media and internet connectivity. And that one day it's gonna sprout one time and it's gonna become, uh, there's gonna be a rebirth of Pan-Africanism. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah said, seek the political kingdom first. And so we're all seeking the political kingdom first and there's a possibility it will all come to fruition at the same time across the continent. Mm -hmm. So don't give up. There's nothing that you do every single, day, every single day that is in vain. I think the work we need to do when you go back home is to read our history. Yes. Because history will actually help us understand that the struggle is connected and the struggle is not easy. And in the struggle, people will bleed because the oppressor is oppressing. Um, because you, you've made reference to the Black Lives Matter movement, and this is a conversation um, that has been going on in little pockets about whether there's a connection between the lives of Black people outside Africa and the state of the continent, and whether we can realistically expect the lives of Black people outside the continent to get better if Africa does not get its act together. What do you think? I think uh, one of the things we must do as Africans, uh, we must reclaim our dignity and our humanity first. Because of colonization and slavery, we've been undignified. We're seen as a, as a debt, as a problem. And so for us to liberate ourselves, we must, as Bob Marley said, emancipate our minds from mental slavery. Our minds are captured by colonial stories. Our esteem is gone. So if we can reclaim our self-esteem and our dignity, doesn't matter if we're naked. We can be naked and not ashamed. We can be poor and not ashamed. And we can be poor with dignity. If we reclaim back mm -hmm. our humanity, it will be good to go. Because it doesn't matter what our leaders are doing, because we are not our leaders. We can't judge 1.2, 1.3 billion people of this continent because of 54 bad leaders, like 54 mm -hmm. shitty leaders. We are more than our leaders. And our dignity and our humanity is not tied in our leaders. So I believe a more equal, just, and humane continent is possible. And that will start with just reclaiming our dignity. That I am a man, that I am a woman, that I do exist outside of my leadership and outside of the political parties, that my dignity does not come because I have money or because I have clothes. That's because I'm a human being. I am human. Because this talk doesn't come to white people. White people can be naked and be mad, but they're humanized. Or they can go shoot up an entire church and kill people, but they're humanized. Why don't you humanize Africa? So we must reclaim back our humanity and our dignity. And when you do that, you shall be free. I look at what you know. I agree with Boniface. And I also think that there is a strong connection between Black people in Africa and Black people um, in the African diaspora because the issue or the systems that are oppressing us are the same systems. They are colonial systems. They are imperialist systems. They are white supremacist systems. So the same system that is oppressing black lives in the US, you know, the police system, which was built from um, police patrols during slavery to, to recapture enslaved people, is the same system that is pushing American and Western imperialism on Africa and black people globally. So I think that uh, we all are fighting the same fight. It's just that the manifestations of the effects of these um, systems on us may look different from community to community, but it's still the same colonial imperialism, white supremacist system that we are fighting. And so it's important for us to build uh, movements and stand in solidarity with our siblings across the continent um, to be able to dismantle these systems that keep trying to push us down. Because a lot of the um, issues that we have as far as leadership in Africa is concerned and the oppression of Africans is because we are still struggling to understand and utilize you know, the leftovers of colonial systems in our own country. So we have to think about how we dismantle this and we can do this by building solidarity and also by working with our siblings across the continent to realize uh, uh, this goal. So yes, there are strong connections. They may manifest differently, but we're still we're oppressed by the same systems across the globe. Dr. Wimpini Fatima Mohammed and Mr. Boniface Mwangi, thank you so much for joining us at uh, the 2020 Ake Arts and Book Festival. Thank you for making the time to speak to us about issues of leadership and inclusion, gender and young people. If you 